You're listening to The Reality Check, episode 396, recorded April 5th, 2016. This is your reality check. Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Reality Check, your weekly Canadian podcast that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. I am your host, Darren McKee, and with me, as usual, are Adam Gardner. What's up, catch boys? Christina Roach. Hello. And Pat Roach. Hi, everyone. We have a great show for you today. Three interesting segments, as usual. Christina is going to talk to us about misleading headlines. Are there any other type? And I'm going to talk to you about whether China has banned April Fool's. But first, Adam is going to explore whether French's ketchup is better for Ontario. Indeed. If you're from Ontario and you have internet access, you may have heard that if you don't hate Canada, you should be buying French's ketchup. What? We recently received the following email from listener Peter. Subject, French's ketchup. I am getting indications on my Facebook that imply buying French's ketchup rather than Heinz is somehow supporting Ontario Industries. This may be a subject worthy of your attention. This was a few weeks ago. I'd heard about it, but I wasn't sure if there was really an angle that I could use for a segment, unless there's something that's stated that's wrong, counterintuitive, or somehow more complicated than it seems. There isn't really much for us to look into. But the story evolved a bit since then, and I thought there was something to cover. Simply put, this is kind of true. More specifically, things are complicated, and maybe. Oh, and by the way, Ontario is a province which houses our city of Toronto, most populous city, and our nation's capital, Ottawa, even though we all live close to the border of the states. Indeed. This all started with a February 23rd Facebook post, which read as such. Since Heinz decided to pull the plug on its Canadian plant in Leamington, 740 jobs were lost. Heinz decided to make its ketchup solely in the USA. Then, French's, known for its mustard, stepped in and decided to make ketchup. They also decided to use those same Leamington tomatoes from Canadian farmers. The result? A ketchup, free of preservatives, free of artificial flavors, also free of high fructose corn syrup. We bought a bottle. Absolutely love it. Bye bye, Heinz. Shared 133,000 times. (laughs) Wow. That's a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Um, So this is... Pretty much legit news, um, you know, ignoring all of this hubbub about uh, no artificial flavors and preserves and crap like that. Um, Heinz sold their factory in Leamington, Ontario to Highbury Canco. French's gets their paste, their tomato paste from Highbury Canco. So yes, the French's ketchup in the grocery store comes from those tomatoes. There was a media storm that followed this. Brian Fernandez, who originally made the Facebook post, was getting all sorts of media interviews. You look through his Facebook, he's like, hey, I got six calls today and all kinds of stuff. So good for him. Um, (laughs) And then Loblaws pulled the French's ketchup from their shelves. Conspiracy theories were coming up about how Heinz was buying out shelf space or the PC brand was pushing out French's ketchup. Loblaws simply said that the sales over the past year had not been good. And I quote, Demand for the product has been consistently low. As a result, we have decided to no longer offer it as part of our regular inventory. So that's that. Not really. An internal memo was leaked that said that Loblaws had stopped stocking French's ketchup because it was cannibalizing sales of President Choice's ketchup. President's Choice being Loblaws' own internal brand. Loblaws said that this was a mid-level employee whose memo was unofficial and misinformed. They state that customer preference was the reason it was taken away. Anyone who works for a company with more than about six employees can probably understand that this explanation is certainly plausible, and it's not unusual for employees to make outlandish, baseless assumptions about things. All said, it may be a factor, but Loblaws is really in the business of making money. The profit margin on their own brands are going to be higher, but if the volume of a name brand's sales are high enough to make up for it and make more money, they're going to go with that. Social media once again erupted, and a day later, Loblaws put it back on the shelves. People were threatening to boycott Loblaws over a ketchup they'd never heard of until they saw something on Facebook about it. It really does seem just to be about sales, and if people want to buy ketchup because of what they saw on Facebook, this is good news for Loblaws. They're selling ketchup. They're happy. Amidst the debacle, Loblaws pointed out that they also have Canadian ketchup. We are strongly committed to supporting local businesses and the Canadian economy. In fact, President's Choice Ketchup is produced here in Canada. (laughs) 
They just try Loblaws. No one cares about that. They just want the French's ketchup. So, curious about this. Uh, I looked at the labels of both products and was frustrated that I can't really tell where food comes from by looking at the label. Both French's and Heinz products um, have something vague, like produced for with an address in Ontario, usually somewhere near Toronto. A lot of different products have similar kind of things. I was hoping to expose some hypocrisy by finding out that French's mustard wasn't Canadian or something like that. It was extremely difficult to find out where those mustard seeds come from um, because it wasn't on their website or the packaging, but it turns out I read an article that mentioned that they were from Saskatchewan. That is in Canada. So that's that. Well, actually, those French's tomatoes come from Ontario, but the stuff you buy at the grocery store is actually manufactured in a plant in Ohio from paste that comes from Leamington. So the ketchup that is used in food services, like those that A&W has now decided to start serving in their restaurants, is manufactured in Toronto, but the stuff on grocery store shelves is generally made in Ohio. So, yes, the ketchup's Canadian-ish, <laughs> bottled in Ohio, so you're, you're supporting all sorts of different people. Well, where's the sugar from? That's the second ingredient, so... <laughs> Uh, it's not from high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> okay. Um, cane sugar, probably from the States, but I mean, I, I don't want to say anything that could be completely... I'm going to just say it's Brazil and see if anyone writes in. <laughs> it comes from my basement. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Homer Simpson sold me this sugar. Yeah. Um, so further, further muttering the issue, Heinz actually still does a bunch of manufacturing in Leamington. Some people have called for boycotts of Heinz products in general because they left Leamington and cost hundreds of jobs. But Heinz is actually the biggest customer of Highbury Canco that bought the plant. Dozens of popular Heinz products are still made at the plant. This includes beans, tomato juice, canned pasta, infant cereal, chili sauce, vinegar, and a bunch of more stuff. But Heinz ketchup is not made from those tomatoes. John Patterson, the mayor of Leamington, warn consumers that boycotting all Heinz products could negatively impact Highbury Canco. So French's ketchup is made from Ontario tomatoes. Where is anything else made? Who knows? That stuff isn't on the labels, and unless there's a Facebook campaign behind it, people don't seem to give it much thought. Buy whatever ketchup you want. Boycotting Loblaws or Heinz isn't going to help Canadians. Buying French's ketchup, which is manufactured in Ohio, might help a little if that's the kind of tribalism that you really care about. There's potentially a whole other topic here about, you know, whether buying local is a good idea, um, what's, you know, what's good for your local economy or good for the world, um, and how sustainable it is. But that's sort of a whole other issue. Um, but this is, this is something that some people find important, and uh, for most products, they just can't really tell when something's Canadian or where it comes from. It's interesting how quickly people jump on the bandwagon, though. Oh, yeah. It's actually where I buy all my ketchup and mustard bandwagons. <laughs> well, I kind of understand uh, sort of viscerally why people are concerned about this, right? So uh, here's a company that closed down closed down a plant and potentially shut down a bunch of jobs. Um, and here's someone that kind of came in and, and bought this plant and it's like a success story and they're helping out this small Canadian town. Um, in truth, some people, a lot of people lost their jobs and then a bunch more were created when this new company bought it and it's a complicated issue and there's a lot of, there's a lot of products and... Um, Without that transparency, I'm not sure there's much you can do about it. Is this is this something that we would need to see on packaging where every ingredient comes from? Sounds a little complicated, and would people really care about it? I'm not really sure. It, you know, then there's that buy local thing, which is usually for a health purpose and supporting your local community as well. But yep. this seems so nationalistic because a lot of people aren't that close to this place. And as you know, I bring in that issue of whose lives do we value. And if we say we think everyone's <laughs> lives are equal, it doesn't matter where things are made. In terms of employment, we just want people to be better served and suffering to be less. Yeah. So I find that angle very interesting. Also, as you pointed out, the people who sell things typically don't care at all <laughs> as long as you buy their things. So if they'll pull something and then you say you want to buy it, they'll bring it back. That's fine. <laughs> one, uh, one, one theme that I saw in a few places, Loblaws mentioned this and uh, some some provincial... Uh, government representatives mentioned this as well, was basically like, you know, we're willing to buy Canadian if it's close enough, you know, plus or minus like 10%. And after that, it's just not worth it, right? It's right. just not profitable. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so at the end of the day, it's kind of about money. Um, and it's really complicated. It's like, you're supporting the farmers in this community with this, but maybe not the factory. But then, you know, who's making the money on the company and then their shareholders and there's... Yes, it's good point. really hard to tease this apart, and even for this one ketchup, I'm trying to tease this apart, and I didn't really, um, 
have a have a firm conclusion. So what are you going to do every time you pick up a product on the shelf? Kind of tricky. In the world is flat. Thomas Friedman did a good description of how his laptop was made by Dell, okay. and how many different countries it went through, and how many different <laughs> pieces came from different parts, oh, and it was just yeah. incredibly extraordinary, complicated, and ways in which you wouldn't think it would still be feasible to ship it from one place to another to add, you know, a dollar's worth of parts <laughs> and something else and something else and something else. Well, anyway, the supply chains. Well, of course, a laptop is obviously more complicated than ketchup, but some yeah. other foods it may be comparable. Well, there's so many. F- there's so many different ingredients in ketchup, and they're all going to come from different, potentially different places. Yeah, um, and they're probably not all coming from one farm in Ontario. It would be kind of impractical. True. While it's not exactly on point, I'm reminded of a segment that uh, Elan did on episode 251 when he talked about buying local, and he talked about the idea that under many circumstances the growing conditions or the conditions for making food are much better in places that are much further away um that it really is cost effective to get stuff that's not local yeah it certainly can be and certainly our listeners relish the idea of catching up to our back catalog and mustard so christina misleading news headlines are there any other type and unless they're punny i don't want to know (laughs) The most important topic TRC has ever covered. Mm. Do I have your attention? I like Mm. hyperbole. That's that's my version of audio clickbait. (laughs) Halfway through a podcast, someone's listened to or not. Wait till you hear what the punchline is. The American Press Institute says that six out of ten people do not read past a headline. (laughs) Now, considering how misleading headlines are, that's a little concerning, isn't it? Here's an example of an alarmingly misleading headline cited in an article from U.S. business mag Fast Company. In late 2014, CNN published a piece titled Ebola in the Air, a Nightmare That Could Happen. Now, the implication of this headline is that the Ebola virus could possibly mutate to be airborne Mm -hmm. and therefore potentially be transmitted through coughing or sneezing, which is pretty scary. Currently, the Ebola virus spreads only through direct contact with bodily fluids. The article goes on to cite Dr. Michael Osterholm, director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. I can't imagine anything in my career, and this includes HIV, that would be more devastating to the world than a respiratory transmissible Ebola virus. Okay, But the same article goes on to say that the World Health Organization scientists are unaware of any virus that has dramatically changed its mode of transmission. So if you're one of the four out of ten people that actually read past the headline, (laughs) Osterholm quashes any fear the headline may have incited. Says Osterholm, Speculation that Ebola virus disease might mutate into a form that could easily spread among humans through the air is just that, speculation unsubstantiated by any evidence. Osterholm does mention that every time a new person gets Ebola, the virus does get a chance to mutate and develop new capabilities. But he and other experts are clear that the chances are relatively small that Ebola will make that jump, and they couldn't think of another virus that has made the transition from non-airborne to airborne in humans. So perhaps a more appropriate headline would have been, Ebola in the air? No need to worry just yet. Now, CNN isn't the only media outlet guilty of writing misleading headlines. We've tackled a few misleading headlines, but one of the most egregious examples was on episode 373. Darren looked into the reporting around a published study from World Health Organization's cancer agency, IARC, regarding links between cancer and the consumption of red and processed meat. So here are just a couple of choice headlines. Eating red meat is just as bad as smoking a cigarette. Wow. Processed meats rank alongside smoking as cancer causes. Ham sausages cause cancer, red meat probably does too, WHO group says. Now, as Darren explained to us at the time, red and processed meat are among 940 agents reviewed by the IARC found to pose some level of theoretical hazard. So in truth, everything pretty much causes cancer. (laughs) Only one substance he cited, a chemical in yoga pants, was declared by the IARC not to cause cancer. Fantastic. Okay, so isn't the practice of using misleading headlines harmless as long as you digest the article to form your own conclusions? 
perhaps, but as it turns out, reading beyond the headline may not actually be enough to correct the headline's misdirection. Wow. In a series of studies published in the Journal of Experimental Psychology, researchers were able to demonstrate that initial impressions formed from reading a headline can have a measurable influence on a person, even if that person reads enough of the corresponding article to recognize the headline's flaws. Hmm. This may explain why many of your friends and family post stuff on their news feed that leaves you scratching your head. Ulrich Ecker, a psychologist and cognitive neuroscientist at the University of Western Australia, led the study to determine how slight shifts in headlines can affect reading. The researchers ran two experiments with numerous components, but I'm just going to focus on the part that's the most relevant to the Ebola headline issue. In one test, Ecker and his colleagues asked participants to read several short articles. Some had slightly misleading headlines, while others had headlines that were broadly accurate in the context of the article. One particular test article was about the safety of consuming genetically modified food. So the article quotes a consortium of scientists backed by a National Science Academy who claim that the safety of GMO food, quote, has been confirmed by many peer-reviewed studies worldwide. The article also includes a quote from an organic food advocate stating that the impact of long-term health from eating genetically modified food remains undetermined. All test participants read the same article. However, some test participants had a headline that read, GM foods are safe, while others had a headline that read, GM foods may pose long-term health risks. Hmm. After reading the articles, test participants were given a surprise quiz with questions concerning both recollection and inference. In the case of the genetically modified food article, participants who read misleading headlines were more concerned with its safety. When asked to predict the future public health costs of genetically modified foods, people who had read the misleading headline predicted a far greater cost than the evidence had warranted. Despite the fact that both groups read the exact same article, the headline created a gap in perception between the participants. Test participants who read articles with accurate or congruent headlines tended to rely more on the content of the article itself when answering questions than those who saw misleading or incongruent headlines. The researchers concluded a misleading headline can thus do damage despite genuine attempts to accurately comprehend an article. Now, if you don't trust science, you probably wouldn't consider the headline misleading, and you likely aren't listening to this podcast either. (laughs) But Ecker points out the big problem with misleading headlines is they're just that misleading, as opposed to being outright wrong. So it's not like they warrant corrective updating. The fact that an editor highlights a certain detail in a headline suggests to some that this detail carries more weight than all the other info presented in the article. So a misleading headline can actually impair a reader's ability to make accurate inferences. As we know here at TRC, correcting misinformation takes a lot out of you. (laughs) Although Ecker and his team hope to empower people by raising their awareness of misleading headlines, the responsibility really falls on the shoulders of editors and publishers who often misrepresent a story with a headline that just baits the reader. As Maria Konakova summarizes in her New Yorker article, it's not always easy to be both interesting and accurate, but as Ecker's study shows, it's better than being exciting and wrong. That's a great quote. Yeah. Except you'll be out-competed by the others, and then you'll lose market share, and then advertising, and then they'll win, and you lose. <laughs> we'll define better, I guess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Alive. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I'm just skimming the surface. Um, there were a couple of other things mentioned in the articles I have in the show notes that were really interesting as part of this study. So I recommend people checking that out. Cool. Thanks, Christina. A good exploration of misleading headlines, which are a plague on all of us, Mm -hmm. and no more so than perhaps on April Fool's Day, (laughs) when misleading headlines abound. Although they're intentionally misleading, so maybe that's a bit different. I certainly thought that uh, this past year had its bevy of interesting and amusing ones. The one I liked the most was Library and Archives Canada, a government organization from the Canadian federal government, released uh, a profile, a biography, if you will, of Logan a.k.a. Wolverine, who is from Canada, and gave some backstory of when he was born and his file, and it was declassified, and like, ah, my tax dollars are being spent well. <laughs> That's funny. Um, 
I usually find they're kind of annoying, but the uh, the Cat Cafe in Chelsea, which uh, I, I frequent a lot, uh, did a, a fake article about their new collaboration to have um, like assistant uh, animal, a companion animal, cats to answer the phone and start the oven and all these all these ridiculous <laughs> things. There's no way you'd ever get a cat to do. So it was cute. Not too many people found this uh, funny necessarily, but Google did this April Fool's Day joke that kind of backfired on them. They did a minion mic drop. So mm-hmm. if you sent an email, it was the button was right next to the normal send button. Oh. Um, and apparently some people were sending business email and they were putting <laughs> minion mic drops in their email people, to their boss. I think people actually were pretty unhappy about yeah. that, weren't they? To me, that sends a strong message, quite frankly. Uh, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say that the funniest thing I saw was that the uh, Surrey, BC, RCMP put out a video, uh, and it was about the idea that, um, and it looked quite official, it was the idea that um, people had become accustomed to uh, to hearing sirens, and so when a an emergency vehicle was coming up behind them, they weren't pulling over anymore, so they were trying to switch up the sound of the sirens, and as the video went on further, you realize that it was just like the police had like a loudspeaker and they were just making woo 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 <laughs> noises. <laughs> very, very funny. So with all this joy, could it possibly be true that China has banned April Fools? Well, I was told by a relative that China banned April Fools, and of course I wondered if this was true, because I'm a jerk relative that doesn't believe anything anyone tells me. <laughs> Now, uh, I could see non-Western news agencies put out warnings, given that many stories will be written and shared that aren't even meant to be true, and how would one know, especially if there are different time zones on Earth? A story comes out, you're on a different day. Given that The Onion, a U.S. satirical publication, uh, and many other ones routinely fool U.S. citizens, (laughs) including U.S. elected officials, I can imagine the problem is only worse for other countries. Oh, yeah. There was an issue in the U.S. Uh, with an Onion article talking about Planned Parenthood performing tons of abortions in this, like, abortion plex <laughs> compound that they created. And one of the Republicans is holding up this, we can't have this, this is wrong, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's not true. This is satire. Yep. And then uh, North Korea uh, thought that their leader was actually voted the sexiest man alive. <laughs> also, also from the Onion. <laughs> Doesn't mean it's not true, though. Just want to clarify that. Yeah. Regarding whether April Fool's was banned by China, you can put that in a search engine and you can see various news agencies and websites ran the story, often with a similar quote. And here's the quote. April Fool's Day is not consistent with our cultural tradition or socialist core values, state news agency Xinhua announced on social media Friday. Hope nobody believes in rumors, makes rumors, or spreads rumors. Now, a news agency saying April Fool's is banned on April Fool's Day would definitely be seen as untrue if it was published in Canada. (laughs) But it isn't clear. (laughs) So if we try to think through this, first, by logic alone, it would be the most relevant day to post such a thing, right? If everyone's going to talk about April Fool's Day on April Fool's, you're going to be like, no, no, we can't have this. Or maybe at least like the day before, right? Because then the next Mm -hmm. day, people know. better. But... On the other side, no article ever linked to the actual piece from the news agency Xinhua. It's probably not English. Well, I thought even if it was Chinese, give me the link. No, put in, yeah, put in Google Translate. Sure, exactly. Then I could pretend I understand and no, maybe it was real or not. You can glean the information. Sure, exactly. It also seems like it'd be easy enough given that they link many other things in articles nowadays. Yes. Now, second, as the Washington Post said, quote, As part of a long-running effort to win control of the narrative on social media and deter dissent, China's Communist Party launched a campaign three years ago to criminalize the spreading of rumors. Xinhua's post suggests an April Fool's Day prank that mocked or undermined the party could have potentially serious consequences. Now, this first part is referring to the fact that back in 2013, China did actually indicate that anyone who posts rumors that are untrue could face up to three years imprisonment if they are reposted by more than 500 people or seen more than 5,000 times. Oh, People have been punished for posting about aliens and zombies among some of the more elaborate online hoaxes. Sounds fantastic. (laughs) Well, right. So we'll get to that at the end. Whether that's good or bad, we'll come back to it. So in a way, though, this is not funny at all. And as someone in China said, like, it's very easy out of a country of 1.3 billion people to get 500 people (laughs) to repost something, relatively speaking. Now, again, on the side that this is legitimate, Washington Post headline was, and this is a quote, no joke. April Fool's Day has been banned in China. The problem is, is that it was published on April 1st. Yeah. <laughs> so it's still really hard to say. And you're like, no, no, it's not a joke. You're like, did you have to publish it today, though? <laughs> <laughs> so 
so this Washington Post piece then quotes other social media users in China saying things like, every day is April Fool's Day, and this is Xinhua's joke, don't you see? <laughs> and of course, this longer one, today is April Fool's Day in the West when you can publicly lie and not be punished. Why don't we do the opposite and make this truth-telling day, the user wrote. Hopefully today we can speak the truth, express our true feelings, show our true colors, spread the truth without being restricted or punished, without getting blacklisted as inciting crime. End of those quotes. The actions of the Chinese government do raise some interesting issues about how different strategies are pursued by different governments. Imagine if someone posted a lot about aliens, and that meant they'd actually go to jail. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> but this doesn't mean that person would actually stop believing in aliens, and sometimes dissent backfires, and that can build coalitions, which then spur different types of thinking. Sort of like the Streisand effect. Don't read this book. It's banned. Like, well, what's in the book now? Yeah. I think at the show, we all believe it's probably better to try to change people's minds and let most free speech reign as opposed to just jailing people, even though we just saw from misleading headlines, it wouldn't be tempting that somehow yeah. someone was punished for spreading purely false rumors. So this is interesting to think about, and I'm curious what the panel thinks. But as for whether this is true or not, as far as I can tell, it is true. It is consistent with how China understands the spreading of rumors and falsities. And I think some of it is just absolutely preposterous. Like, oh, they're now making this suit made out of babies. And then the story gets picked up, and it's obviously not true, and then people start to believe it. So either they're trying to crack down on that, as well as, of course, any sort of criticism of the party. As we know, there are certain words that can't even be searched, and other social media platforms are heavily pleased. So it seems like it's true. Uh, based on all the research I could do, but of course I could just Google and they all came up on April 1st and no one said afterwards this isn't true, so I was at a loss. And it sort of made me think that how do you engage in the enterprise of fact-checking anything when every publication comes from a day that by definition is supposed to be suspicious? You just get stuck. So I thought that was just interesting as an experience. Like, well, that's the Washington Post. It says no joke. <laughs> yeah, no joke. is that true? <laughs> I think this is such an interesting concept, like, you know, it's it's so tempting, you know, and my immediate reaction was, oh, that's great if you could just, you know, if people could have legal consequences to just lying. But I mean, you know, what's a lie? Is a person is a person wrong or are they trying to deceive people or is it a joke? And it's so hard to tease that apart. And really, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a free country, you know, relatively free, you, you, you wouldn't really want to have a, a law like that. But, uh, there is a certain part of it that's just like, what's the harm? And if there is an intended harm and people get hurt, then you kind of want there to be consequences. Yeah, you're right. And there's a degree, right? Proportionality. Like, yeah. there was an April Fool's story about Justin Timberlake moving to Toronto. Whether that's true or not, I don't think it matters to almost anyone. <laughs> I'm sure someone in Toronto is disappointed and someone in L.A. is happy that he's not moving because yes. it wasn't true. But whether climate change is true seems yes. really important. Yes. But because you could say there's a scientific debate, and even though whatever it is, 97% of scientists agree that it's a huge issue, you can find one guy with a doctor who's like, no, it's not. And then that's not really a lie. It's just a disagreement. So much as, so much, yeah, it's the difference between being wrong and deceiving. Right. And even like for most sort of um, alt-med pseudoscience kind of d these products, you know, even the ones that are really dangerous – most of the time, the person selling it doesn't know it's crap. Right. They think it's legit. I would agree with you, Adam. I think uh, the vast majority of people who would spread things that we would normally jump yeah. all over as pseudoscience are just wrong. They're not being deceived. Right, which you could say that th you still get punished. Right? Yeah. Like if, if you, you know, steal things, and even though you don't mean to, you maybe get a different type of sentence. <clears throat> I guess what I'm saying is that I'm okay with people being wrong. Because the discourse, hopefully, based on the idea that science is a meritocracy, yeah. will bear that out. Um, so I don't think the, the the idea that people may have some some ideas that are are misguided, um, the fact that they voice them often is what starts the discourse. Yeah, I generally feel that like the right reaction to misinformation is education rather than punishment, right? I heard today that uh, China is blocking any news regarding the Panama Papers pointing to Chinese officials being mm -hmm. implicated. Yeah, you mentioned that. That sounds true. And it's always just <laughs> that doesn't yeah, sound like a It's always so headline. amazing to me that they just can block. Oh yeah. Any of that coming in, that people just yeah, do not cannot access that stuff like we can. It's certainly true that we should appreciate the freedom of access that we do have even if we think it's how things should be. It's not often how things are in many places. Mm -hmm. 
even with this free podcast being piped into your ears, dear listeners. Joining us once again, thank you so much. Adam informed us that French's ketchup is actually made from tomatoes from Ontario. But of course, the entire supply chain and how a product is manufactured and know who you're actually supporting when you buy something is a bit more complicated. Christina explored the problematic nature of misleading headlines. That first, the headline themselves is possibly the only thing that people read. And then beyond the headline, if you actually read the story, it's not going to be vastly different the headline because it's only misleading, not overtly wrong, which makes it harder to update your beliefs to something more true. And I told you that China has apparently banned April Fool's, which seems like it's true. Until next time, think better, act better. Peace out, catchoids. Stay classy, not smartassy. Apologies to Neil deGrasse Tyson, we ran out of time. The Reality Check is an independently Canadian-produced podcast. For show notes or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at trc underscore podcast. What's right. the website where we can get those uh, show notes? Well, Adam, that would be trcpodcast.com. Oh. It's a great website. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so do y'all. Make your own ketchup out of tomatoes grown in your backyard. Otherwise, you're a traitor. <laughs> that was the conclusion. <laughs> That's-